The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Brett, thanks for taking some time to join me on the Australian Investors Podcast, mate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's um, I, the more I learned about your backstory, the more I was intrigued. And it's easy to see why so many of our um, Twitter uh, Illuminati that follow both of us, uh, I can see why they, they wanted me to have this chat with you. So I'm really excited to hear about the business about your story and about just how you view the world. I thought maybe we could start off with just a couple of really quick fire questions, if you don't mind. If you could have dinner with one person who is living, so that's kind of like the asterisk there, who would it be and where would you take them? Yeah, it would be great to um, have dinner with Warren Buffett, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, he'd be the top of my list. Number yep. two would be Charlie Munger. <laughs> um, <laughs> And ideally because of both of their advanced age and my unwillingness to waste their time, I'd like to uh, have dinner with them together <laughs> and anywhere that, you know, anywhere that suited them is always my approach. Yep. I like um, it. Uh, you know, I think those two would be pretty amazing um, people to meet. No, they would. Um, I'm sure if they serve Coca-Cola, uh, they would be they would be there. So, okay, one yeah, relatively like relatively obvious for you know for people that know me, I would be relatively obvious that I would say that. Yeah, I would also say that I was asked recently. I can't, I went to Omaha for the annual meeting, and I was asked, you know, did you get to meet Warren? Would you, you know, would you love to meet Warren? And given the advanced age of both of them and their generosity in sharing their learning, that I feel like I've benefited from just enormously over the last 30 years i i couldn't ask them to spend time with me because i think they've been so generous and i've learned so much from them i honestly would have you know no particular questions for them other than i'd love to say hey can you look at our accounts and tell us what you think and let us know if there's anything we should tidy up or do better (laughs) that would be unbelievably selfish for guys in their 90s to expect them to waste their time on my particular question well you never know mate you've got a you've got a knack for getting into places and talking to people so you never know maybe they're listening maybe charlie can uh, can yeah. give you a call after this um my my next one mate is uh what's one lifestyle hack you wish you knew about 20 years ago oh walking ten thousand steps a day i've mm-hmm. done so much training through all of the sport i played and all of the different hobbies and physical activities i enjoy but um around the 27th of December, I decided having watched a bunch of YouTube video that I'd just commit to doing 10 steps a day. And until I strained my calf muscle two weeks ago at the snow, I'd done it literally virtually every single day without fail since. It's made me so much fitter and stronger. Um, And then the other one was don't drink alcohol. You know, I gave up alcohol at the same time. Um, I, I love a drink in a particular location. I always treated alcohol like a travel log. You know, if you want to be in Venice, drink a spritzer. If you want to be in Argentina, drink a Malbec. Um, But um, red, it's a waste of time, makes you tired. I have a huge energy advantage because I'm just was born with a lot of energy. And I thought, why why give up any of that edge for that? So they're the two that have made the most difference. 
um, sort of one I'm pursuing at the moment is um, eat many more green things. Mm. Yeah, I think um, what's the a new one now is basically consumed by 30, 30 different types of plant. Um, if, if you can do it every day, if not every week, um, I think that's a, that's a big one. So I'm really interested in the blue zone. So the nine things that lead to longevity and um, not from a, you know, let's live to a thousand from some sort of strange focus on that, but just, you know, how to be a well-being because, you know, Buffett says you do much better if you've got a long time to compound. And so looking after your wellness makes so much for, you know, myself. It's just a really interesting area I've been poking around in. It's great. Mm. Um, mate, I thought for people that don't know about you or about Kelly Partners, the business, can you start back at the beginning for us? Tell, take us on a bit of a journey with with your life. It's been pretty well documented. If you go to your website, your personal website, if you have read it, if, it, if you've read any of your books, uh, people will be familiar with you. But for those that aren't, I think just a kind of like where did you where did you grow up? Was business and investing and this type of thing part of your existence as a as a kid? Yeah, I grew up in Sydney. Family of eight boys, two half brothers, five brothers. Um, great father who'd come out from Australia as a um, from England. You know, with five bucks or five pound or whatever it was in those days. And dad was, you know, was great with people and had a real go-get mentality that I think being prepared to get up and move countries to do something, I think it shows a sort of growth mentality that say today. And um, he just always, he was my number one supporter. You know, he's dead now. He's been dead a long time. Um, and uh, he just always, you know, said that basically whatever you, you dream and you're prepared to work you know, very, very hard at, um, you can probably make happen if you work well with people. And so I, you know, I think it's very important that I read Buffett's story. He really had the support of his father. Um, I feel very much the same. And um, he was a massively influential person in my life that just gave me this belief that I could do anything. You know, you mentioned my ability to get to great people. You know, I, I was a kid who came first in everything. I played every sport and all of academics and went went straight from school to price waterhouse at 18 did nearly five years i left to join an investment bank um i lost my job didn't fit in with other people i was the youngest person by a decade i remember one of the people there said to me you know why do you read these books about people that write books to make money you know out of writing the books and i said well do you know who this book's about and she said no I said, well, it's about a guy called warren buffett it was hagstrom's book um the warren buffett way in 1997 and, um, and I thought, well, I don't have much in common with people that don't know who a guy like this is. I always had a global outlook. I think that came from my dad and always wanted to know how to do things the best and, you know, that they could be done in the world. And I never sort of understood why you wouldn't think like that. If you're going to bother to do something, dad would always say, do it the best that you can. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. My dad gave me two books, Think and Grow Rich, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I realized that in all my academic, the study of working well with people was not part of any academic curriculum. When I finished my master's of tax and my tax and my chartered accounting, there's really nothing in there that said that, you know, how to lead and manage and work with people by far the most important thing. And then Think and Grow Rich, find people that have been successful and ask them what they did. And for me, I define success as the ability to achieve your goals not someone else's goals, not external goals that someone else puts on you, which I'd done a lot of. You know, I was told, you need to do this, you need to do that. So I pursued those things. When I lost my job, I felt this huge relief and freedom that I could redefine my life and decide how it is that I wanted to, to live. And it sounds really odd at 22, but I went to Morgan and Banks outplacement and I was in this floor full of people that had lost, lost their jobs. They were basically all men in their mid-50s. And I came home that night and I knew that they had the full disaster, mortgages, kids in private schools, et cetera, et cetera. And somebody had taken their business card. Their whole sense of self had been taken. It was very, very sad and a huge warning. So I went back to uh, Morgan & Banks. I had six weeks. I looked up a little book called Think, um, uh, The Who's Who of Australia. It was a little um, Maroon book in those days. And I basically came up with a list of 80 people that I wanted to meet in Australia. And... I um, wrote them a letter. I just said, you know, dear Mr. Hawk, Bob Hawk, former Prime Minister, 
I'm 22. I'm, only, I'm really keen to learn. If there's anything that you'd be prepared to share with me in an hour face-to-face interview, answering my 11 standard questions, I will put it in a book and get it out to other young people that are keen to learn. I made five and a half thousand phone calls in three months. I got 34 out of 80 of those people to speak with me. I met Ray Martin as, at a, I tracked him down to a art center opening and, and said, Ray, look, I'm doing this book. I love you in the book. And he said, how many people have you got? And I said, 33. You'll be the 34th. I've been ringing, ringing, ringing. He said, how long did it take you to get them? And I said, um, you know, and people in the US listening, it's, you know, like Larry King, Ray Martin, really. And um, and I said, um, you know, it's taken me 10 weeks. He couldn't believe it. He said, no worries. Come and see me. I had spent all of the money that I'd earned and saved since I'd started work. And I think that's a big sort of lesson in terms of my mindset and the way that I play life and business. I've always been prepared to invest in my own learning. I spent 50 something, fifty two, fifty five thousand dollars that I'd saved. I was on 16, 17, 18,000, 25,000 a year over those four or five years. When I was at Pricewaterhouse, I took all that money. I put it into the production of the book. I didn't have enough to print the book. So a mate of mine, I was working in his company that was the first software company to take Bloomberg feeds, put it into 34 different valuation methodologies, in particular EVA, economic value added based on Rappaport's book. And we, we would train that in organizations that were trying to make better capital allocation decisions. But he, he introduced me uh, to a bunch of people and said, Brett, you need to know how to raise capital. So I went to those seven people. I said, I need 22,000 or 21,000 to print these 5,000 books, um, seven people, 3,000 each. I promised to give you the money back. And then we got the book out. I self-published it. I'd been told that, you know, Brett, you won't get anyone, you won't get these interviews. When I went back to the publishers who said they had 20 years experience, they said, well, look, I know you've got the people, but um, you're not Ray Mutt or Philip Adams, so who'd want to read your book? Um, there's 800 new books come out every week. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, so I self-published the book. That's why I needed the 21,000. I got a PR person. I organized the design, printing, production, et cetera, got the book out. It was an amazing skill set to, to acquire. And what that forced me, I read a book that said, read a book every week. So I'm reading a book every week. Um, uh, Mark Victor Hansen uh, and Jack Canfield had the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. They had 20 Ds in a pack with a workbook. I got it from the US, sent by snail mail, I sat down and listened to every CD. I did the workbook. I did exactly what they said to do. I bought the Simon & Schuster self-help tape catalog which was a whole bookshelf i bought a bookshelf from somewhere for five dollars put them all in there and while i was making all my phone calls and doing my book i was listening to these amazing speakers and they said look if you can work out clearly where you want to go then make a plan sort of you know stephen covey begin with the end in mind and close the gap from there and so just an amazing experience um sold all the books on one day um basically ray martin put the show on put the story on Channel 9, sold all the books and, and never looked back, did a few hundred speaking engagements off the back of that, went back into accounting. I'd been reading everything Buffett had written since I was 17 or 18 years old. I loved everything that I'd heard um, from him and he really resonated sort of with my values, looking for intrinsic value, um, that there is fundamentally some value, you know, in some things that isn't in others um, and not just financial value speaks a lot about the value of um, relationships and um, compounded good behavior and this sort of stuff. And so that was, that was a story. I went through three accounting firms. They all promised one thing and delivered another. So, you know, our second value at Kelly partners is do what you say, because our industry is really founded on, they tell you one thing and they deliver, you know, promise the world, deliver an Atlas. And I thought, Ultimately, a mate of mine on the Central Coast, Scott Elwin, said, you want to start a firm for me? Help me. I can see you could run the business. I'll give you 75%. I'll have 25 And help me get out of this bad partnership and start a firm. Um, he, he, His son Miller was my godson. I said, sure, I'll help you. I set the firm up. After a little while, a few months, I said, look, it's better if it's 5149 because the peanut work and explained why develop. And ever since that day, we've done these 5149 sort of 10-year agreements, et cetera, et cetera. In that journey, I'd read over 3,000 books. I'd read everything on private equity firms and how they structure and corporate advisory and all sorts of stuff. Um, I remember when I was at Schroeder's, they asked me to make a recommendation for a client um, as to what you'd buy if you had all the money in the world. I said Western Australia newspapers, um, just sort of Buffett mindset. Um, and, and so then I was in North Sydney. The boss had promised one thing, delivered another, 
a couple of my colleagues in there said, why couldn't you start a firm for us like you started for your mate Scott? And only very recently, Owen, I've realized that often it's other people that see in you things that you don't necessarily see in yourself. So I ring my two best mates or my biggest clients and said, hey, boys, what do you think about this? This is a shitty proposal I've been given and it's shitty because they said one thing and have promised another and I cannot work with people I can't trust. And they said, Brett, we don't know why you don't already have your own business. Um, you know, you're really great at what you do. And and I'm like, okay, if you say so. So I very reluctantly started the group. But, you know, when I set my mind to something, I'm a very, you know, I remember Ray Martin launched my second book and uh, he stood up and he said, you know, I'm here tonight because Brett asked me uh, to do the book launch. And Brett's like a pig dog. If he gets hold of something, he will never let go. So it's just better to agree. You know, I only have regrets in life. And one of them is I didn't record his speech that night because it was incredible. He's a such a wonderful trained journalist and just summed the whole thing up. So I realized that I, you know, I had this ability from my books and other skills, uh, you know, and all the way back from Carnegie, he said, you know, you've got to be great at leading people, inspiring them and, and um, pulling people together if you want to get things done. And I had learned the most important thing is that you can achieve anything with people. So even though I was told you're unemployed, you got no experience, you got no expertise, you got no money, you got no connections, how are you going to publish this book? I realized that if I put a team together of a designer who had 30 years of experience, of a PR person with 30 years of experience, of a printer with 30 years of experience, of a book distributor with 30 years of experience, that those people would bring their experience you know, hundreds of years of experience together to my team. And if I could sort of humbly set a vision, but get out of the way and let them do their thing, create the right environment, then then they'd knock it out of the park, which is what happened. So that's where I then came to 06 and my boss had said this and then done this. So I said to my wife, okay, started the North Sydney business. We soon rebranded to Kelly Partners, Central Coast and North Sydney. And I, I basically set my mind to, you know, the low bar, I thought, of not doing things worse and was happening in our industry, a massive industry, basically cottage in its mindset and delivery. And I said, well, why can't it be, you know, why can't these be great businesses? And when I read, you know, Jim Collins, I'm, I'm just a reader, I can't help myself. You'll hear me refer to books because I just love them. So Jim Collins, um, good to great, favorite business book other than Snowball and King of Capital. And you know, he said, Wells Fargo, West Coast, we're going to be West Coast and we're going to run a, we're going to be the best at running a bank like a business. And I said, right, Sydney, private business owners, we're going to be the best at running accounting firms as a business. We're going to empower our people, our partners and deliver something amazing for our clients. It's highly differentiated. We're going to run a Walmart strategy of going to small places before, you know, and get big before anyone notices. And so I went to Sydney and said, go to the growth areas find those first or second largest firms, either buy into them or start a firm and get your back-end Walmart and front-end Maccas right so that you've really got a point of difference. It's highly system systemizable and you can do it anywhere um, that you choose um, and deliver consistent, duplicatable, you know, each of our, our partners. We call them partnerships because they are between us and our operating partners and our internal people and our clients and obviously our communities shareholders and so that mindset that i got from buffett of you know it might be corporate by structure but partnership in mentality so i don't do something to you that you know that i don't want you to do to me treat you you know the old golden rule the way i want to be treated very much the mindset from the beginning and i thought that with better values and behavior we could outperform the industry that my experience of had been really poor so that's sort of how you sort of take all of that and come to start a firm very relentlessly pursued um you know, we had a young child, nine months old, Tom, when we started, Beck and I, and Beck was an accountant and totally supportive of what we're doing. And together, you know, Tom would wake up at three in the morning, I'd get up, I'd give her Tom to feed, I'd have a shower, get changed, put my suit on, I'd drive from out of Western Sydney an hour away into North Sydney, to get to the office about 4.30, I'd leave at seven, I'd do that six days a week. I did that for the first couple of years while we pulled it together, I don't work Sundays, and you know, with a lot of luck and a lot of amazing people in the business and, you know, a clear understanding of what we're trying to do, we've got a 30-odd percent CAGR for nearly 17 years in a row. So we've doubled the business every three and average five times in a row. I do think it's duplicatable and that it, that it is a business system. 
It's an incredible story, Brett. Um, I'm actually glad you went there um, and talked about family for a second. I'm just, there's so many things that we could talk about, but I know you've got like the Kelly Partners YouTube channel, you do in interviews and you have um, chats with people on there. So I'll put all the links in the show notes for people that want to follow up with many of these different threads that Brett has just kind of um, scratched the surface of. Brett, there's one thing, and this is more of a selfish one. I'm going off reservation here when it comes to the talking points, but um, how do you think about sacrifice? And in particular, you know, you've read so many books, you've done so many things. I often think that when we try to achieve these things, there's give and take, right? We've got yin and yang, and we to do to pursue this thing, which means we do not pursue this thing. How, I'm interested. Have you thought of that uh, in any way? Yeah, and have I've, reflected on that for yourself? I've thought, yeah, extremely deeply about it. It's very interesting you ask it. I honestly, you know, really thoughtful question. Um, so I believe in sacrifice in the service of other people i think that results in a meaningful life and you know i'm 22 i've lost my job i'm reading bios on everyone i've read business books on everything the major traditions i interviewed the leaders of major religions and major political parties and you know billionaire business people and all sorts of people right across the spectrum work out what's life really all about and i concluded that it's about you know growing in wisdom which is deep understanding and that there is no other way to meaning other than by making good choices. Um, and that, again, you know, Buffett, 20 years, what, what does his choice look like over, you know, in a 20-year context rather than a 20-minute context? And so I say to people, if you're trying to live a self-fulfillment life, that's about taking stuff and try and shove it into you to make yourself feel whole. But really, I believe in a self-sacrifice life where you take your talents and put them, you know, at the service of other people to help other people to make things happen. And that the reward is a knowing that you've done the best work that you possibly can. And that that's the self-satisfaction of real competence. I watched this incredible video for anyone who hasn't seen it. Billy Joel's coming to Australia in December. And I think you can learn from anyone. Now, Billy Joel's a master of what he does. And there's a great interview with, I can't remember his whole name. I think it's Fareed out of the U S then he interviews Billy Joel 45 minutes. And he says, Billy, you know, what is it that's made you so great? And he said, look, I'm a competent man in an incompetent world. He said, I just learned the craft and it takes years, but I got good at it and I'm competent. I don't see myself as Beethoven. He was classically trained and wanted to be Beethoven. But he goes, I'm not Beethoven. Um, that's a great disappointment of my life. He doesn't write new songs. He did 12 albums, the same as the Beatles, hasn't released one since 93, still sells out 71,000 tickets in Melbourne in less than 24 hours. But he said, I'm a competent man in an incompetent world. Now, my kids are on 15, other, um, 17, 15, and 10, two boys and a girl, and said, guys, like, I believe real self-confidence comes from deep competence and that you can't build a you know tall building without a deep foundation, and that foundation is deep competence. But that comes from sacrifice because you can't do two things at once. Now, last night I was watching Kobe Bryant because the kids had said, hey, Dad, love Kobe, you got to watch Kobe. And Kobe's doing this interview with... Um, Patrick Bet David. It's a very good interview, actually, just before he died. And he said, he said, Well, what about your friends from school? He goes, I don't have any friends from school. And he, he's like, Well, how does that work? He goes, Well, they're still friends, but they know they'd never see me because I was working for 20 years on becoming the best basketball player ever. And they love me enough to know that that's who I am. It's not that I don't like them, it's that I have a, another mission, another goal. So you know, it's a very different, it's good when you, no matter what you're doing, I've been blessed. I've had books and now YouTube that I can find other people that share my mindset, whether they live next door to me or, you know, I'm not the son of Kerry Packer or whatnot. So I didn't have people that was encouraging and supporting, but most people don't grow up with a billionaire next door or a guy who loses 50 kilos next door and becomes an Olympian. Or most people have never seen radical personal change to create the life of their dreams. And so they don't really know that it's possible. So getting around people, as Buffett says, lift your standards, get around than you. I've been doing it since I was 22, whether they're like my virtual friends who are in books, whether they're dead people who, you know, you would have loved to meet. Um, that's the game. Now, self-sacrifice is, to me, very out of fashion, but I don't know how you do anything any other way. I think it takes 10 years, it takes more than 10,000 hours, and it, and it is an obsession and a focus at the exclusion of everything else. I say most often to people that when Warren Buffett and Bill Gates are interviewed together, I think it's on Netflix on Inside Bill's Mind, they're asked together, what is the one thing that you think has made the most difference to your success in business? And they answer in unison, focus. 
the day I started the business uh, and before, since I was really 18, I've been doing it for 30 years now. I've been involved in chartered accounting. I have looked relentlessly at how do we do this better? How do we do it deeper? How do we make a difference here? How do we make a difference there? And so the depth to, you know, you can't have a deeper business than the depth of the leader of that business. You can't have a growth business if you don't have a growth senior executive team and a CEO. Um, so you need to be a deep person that wants to go deep and wants to grow in order to run a deep business that's got some some growth in it. And that means often, I've got to tell you, I don't experience it as sacrifice. I never think, oh, shit, I'm not playing golf. I'm talking to Owen. I'd rather be here than playing golf. Every time I do a, a, a podcast with somebody or I talk to a young guy who's got questions or whatnot, in talking about your thoughts and sharing those ideas, it really um, putting the asset on you to keep living out those ideas and pushing them to a higher level. So, so mate, it's it's a very very good question. It's something I'm really passionate about. I it's not really something most people want to hear. It's sort of you know I remember I started dating back, and she'd be like, "Well, what are you doing Saturday?" I go, "Well, I go to work." She's like, "Well, how does that work?" And I go, "Well, I go to work and I do work." She goes, but you don't get paid for doing that work. And I go, no, no, I don't get work. But, you know, work's like a gym. You know, you own the muscles. The boss owns the equipment. You know, you get the muscles. You get to keep the discipline. So so she'd come in with me, work with me doing tax returns. She didn't even work in our firm till 3 o'clock. She goes, okay, what do you do then? I go, well, at 3 o'clock I stop because I've always been very structured and disciplined. And then we go out and do whatever you want until 5 in the morning or whatever you like because I've always had plenty of energy to burn. And she was like, okay, no worries. And so ever since she's known that that's, you know, if I tell you you're going to do something, I will, it's in my day, I will not not do that. I will spill blood to do it. If as an organization, we've said, this is who we want to be, we're going to spill blood to do that. And I guess, as I say to people, you know, there's never been a baby born without a bunch of pushing, shoving and blood it's real sacrifice. There's never been complete a three-year degree or a PhD or build a business or do anything that is worthwhile without a lot of sacrifice up front before you get the reward. Now, a lot of people today think, oh, well, if you get the reward and then you do the work, it's not how it works. And final comment I'd make with the business is I spent the first 10 years, I said, I'm not going to tell anything. I'm not going to say anything publicly about the business other than in top 100 each year, I'll, I'll comment only to BRW about it. Um, we'll do no advertising. What we will do is we'll go deep and build this building properly and I often say to people, you know, when you're digging, 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 and then steel down, and then you pull the concrete, and then you do it again and again and again, it takes years before you even break the surface of level. And when you're down there, knee deep in shit, no one gives you a pat on the back. You know, when I'm doing those late nights, early mornings, six days a week, missing my kids this and my whatever of that, no one comes and says, yeah, Brett, that's great. That'll work out really well it's um, terrific. You have to have the single mindedness to know that you're doing the right thing. And that in the long term, meaning 25 years, it'll probably go okay. And um, that's a very strange mindset that is quite uncommon. Delayed gratification is very much out of fashion. And then all of a sudden, you know, post 10 years, um, people can start seeing you just slapping up floor after floor after floor, and it looks easy. It still takes effort, but it's a bit like Roger Federer hitting a forehand. It looks easy. And, um, you know, you get more people say, well, hang on, can I get involved? Because that looks easy. And we've been determined to keep attracting people that share our values and know that, you know, you put the next floor up by doing a proper job of the one you're doing at the moment. Can I ask one more question around the kind of how you should think about the um, lifestyle side of things? Uh, is how would you define like an, an ideal Tuesday. If you have to pick your Tuesday, I'm, I'm interested in kind of the, the habits that you've formed and that make you more efficient and more effective than average, basically. So how would you start, end your day, and what's in the middle? So I, you start a good day the night before, but you start a great day the year before. So between the 27th and 1st of January, I do all my annual planning. I pull out my big A3 calendar of the year and I block out all of my holidays. I mark them bright yellow and I book holidays and pay for them in it for 12 months, work, work out with my wife where we want to go. And then I put in all of the public holidays, all of the critical business events. So once you've blocked out all of your time so that you've done the critical things, 
I then take that down to a month and a day, what's called an ideal week, um, which I was very lucky to study with a coach, Dr. Fred Gross, who trains real estate agents when I was around 22. When I was trying to get these answers, I interviewed Simon Reynolds. That was his coach. He said, go and see this guy. So I studied with all these real estate guys. But he said, don't do anything that's not dollar productive. Structure up your your ideal week. So my, you know, my days, weeks look like this. You know, they're fully color coded. Um, they're done weeks and weeks, months, like the full year in advance. And so I know, for example, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I typically drive to do meetings uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the gym at lunchtime. I've done that forever. So I've had this structure. And then you know what your priorities are. You put your priorities into your calendar. And if anyone wants to make an appointment, all our calendars at Kelly Partners are open so everyone can see everyone's calendar. It's all color-coded. So I brought all of that into the business that I'd learned personally. Um, and so, you know, I pride myself on being the most organized person that anyone's ever met. I have a 30-year personal plan that does, you know, who do you want to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to give? Where do you want to go? Um, and it's all in a 50-page Excel spreadsheet. You know, again, very, very personally organized means that you can lead that into the business. Um, and the reason, though, and that's so important, Nelson Mandela was somebody's employee, and so was Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs worked at Atari, smelt, wouldn't wear shoes. They put him in a funny room, told him to work at night, and eventually they let him leave because he didn't fit in with other people. Wouldn't Atari be a better business if they'd found a way to work with a guy who was a bit different? Um Mandela was an article clerk in a law firm, same thing. So I've always said to our people, you might have Mandela working for you. You might have Steve Jobs working for you. I hope when he talks about you being a boss in 25 years' time when he's the guy, he says, you know, these guys were really organized. They, you know, were clear about the difference they were trying to make. They took to the task with real energy and enthusiasm. And I'm glad I worked there because I learned so much. You know, they may not say that about, many people in our industry in terms of leaders. So it's certainly what I'd experienced. So really deep personal organization with a 30-year mindset. I got that from, so 30-year plan I got from Michael Hill. No one of to your listeners, you know, you're here. I can talk at a thousand words a minute. Um, I do know a fair bit about a number of things, but I'm just a student. I just love to learn it. it it's what gives me energy. So 30-year plan, Michael Hill, great book, toughen up. If you haven't read that book, read that book. I can remember where I was sitting the night I was reading that book and it said, you know, list your company, keep more than 50%. Okay, do that. So he did that in Australia. I wrote to him just in the lockdowns. It said, dear Mr. Hill, I'd love you to look at ASX, KPG. I read your book, 2009, I think it was. I learned that. I never forgot and I've structured it like this. He wrote me the most beautiful note back, right? And that's the other thing is I write to people who teach me things and just say thank you. So, you know, deep personal organization. Recently, I've been um, working on some stuff by a really great business coach. He's, and that gives you a momentum and a focus that's unusual and a long, you know, I never forget Buffett saying, be a long-term guy in a short-term world just gives you a huge advantage, right? So I always pride myself on being the longest-term person in the room, the most energetic as well, which can be, you know, misleading for people. They think that, if you're energetic, you know, you want to get everything done today. I do, but I have a long-term view. And then you take that and cascade that down into a, you know, good quarterly plan, good month plan. And then I carry objectives around in my wallet like this. Everyone thinks it's naff, but it works. You know, here are my goals. Here's my stuff. I put it in my wallet. I stick it on the, you know, if you go, if anyone sees my car, it's stuck on the, on the wheel of the car. So I see it um, just works for me because it just keeps it, front of mind so these are all personal traits great old american speaker jim Rohn. he said um don't ask that life gets um that the world gets easier um demand of yourself that you get better and then buffett says well you can control you know the micro economy i.e yourself and your business focus on that don't focus on the macro economy or the world that you can't control so i never complain about the weather because i can't control it so if it's if it's cold, I wear a great jumper I, I like. If it's cold, if it's hot, I go for a swim in, in a great pair of uh, cozies I like um, rather than sitting around moaning about things I can't complain. So, look, I think when you meet people, it's right from a business and investing perspective to try and understand that person, where they come from, what motivates them, what are their values. You know, I meet people, they say they want to be the best in the world. What are their personal traits? What time do they get up? How long do they stay up? How much do they train? 
you know, what's their work ethic. And if they don't have that, then it's just a pipe dream. I love it, mate. There's so much to go on there. I looked at your business, right? I'm an investor. I, I study companies. I've been doing this for about 10 years. And um, when all of the people that I follow on Twitter said, you've got to look at Kelly Partners. So I, I took a look at the business, just generally, just quick, quick glance. And I was like, accounting. Okay, interesting. All these people that I speak to, I was like, they're looking for deep, you know, wide moat businesses. They're wanting to be long-term investors. And it just really got me curious about how you think about the business you're building, your defensibility, the industry as a whole. You know, I, I associate, forgive me, but I associate accounting with small practice down the road or maybe, um, you know, a H&R block or something like that. Um, and I, I always questioned how well does this scale? How do you keep people motivated? How do you bust through all those barriers and make sure that every radial part of that network is still thriving the economics work i mean there's so much to tackle there but i mean it, like any way you want to take that kind of statement it's not really a question but kind of a statement i'm happy to go with it so i love the book the outsiders by thorndike but i love the idea that i'd read many years ago um capital cities uh, murphy the ceo got to be a great investor to be a great ceo so I'm working in this company called Value Add. Great guy, Anthony Vanderbilt, was a real mentor to me. And he made this EVA software. And so the basics were if you can if you can get a return capital above your weighted average cost of capital, then that's economic value created. And so few people understand that, right? So I knew that. And then I looked at accounting and I was like, well, hang on, this is a great business, badly done. You know, to me, a classic Buffett play. And I worked out Buffett had invested in H&R Block in the 70s. So I thought, okay, I'm not missing too much here. And then I said, okay, well, if you look out 20 years, as Buffett would say, well, how certain can you be that accounting will exist in the tax system? Well, death and taxes are life's only two certainties. And I thought the American PE groups had got into Australia and bought all the funeral homes, and I, I that wasn't my background. And there's a great sermon by a guy in the 1800s called Diamonds Under Your Feet. And he said, you know, guy owns a farm. He wants to sell it because he wants to go over there. There's more opportunity and the guy comes in and sees this rock on his mantelpiece said where do you get that and he shows him and he goes okay i'll take the farm and that became the biggest open cut diamond mine in america because the guy knew what he was looking at it was a diamond and the other guy just thought it was a rock the first you don't want to go and think let's get into bed in an investment with a founder or a ceo that doesn't know that industry extremely deeply and and also have a real passion for it the investment thesis is simple globally in the west Governments left and right have no interest in spending less money. And that means they have to tax people more. They can't tax multinationals because they can move their money around, but they will tax private business owners. And those private business owners mortgage their houses and generate 70% of all jobs in Australia. So they're the people I really have a, a hard for, a real empathy and connection with. And I, I thought that often they didn't get the world's best you know, accounting tax services. Um, so they're not... H&R Block, and they're not the big four. They're sort of in this middle bit, which is where my father ran a business, got ordinary service from accountants, I thought. I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. They're going to keep taxing people more. So then I looked at the tax act has grown by like 14 times since 1950. It's like compounded at 13% a year by number of pages. There's more lawyers in parliaments around the world today by professional training as a proportion of parliamentarians than there ever has been. And that means they just want to make more laws. You know, stand up, sit down, put your mask on, etc. That's just compliance, and there's going to be more compliance, not less. But everyone says there'll be, you know, less compliance, not more. But that's not true. Um, and then I looked at the industry itself, and I said, well, hang on, these are good businesses that can make a massively positive social impact, but are run typically by technicians as a sort of cottage effort, and they're not well run as businesses. So as a young guy, I had to put up with appalling work environments, and and I thought. I would hear the partner say they do things for clients and they never do them. So I was like, right, there's a massive opportunity here. Not because I thought I could do it better, but I knew I couldn't do it worse. And so that's the thesis. So then you look and say, well, can't you learn from non-accounting firms because, you know, there's not much that you admire about accounting firms if you're me. And so I say, okay, let's let's think about um, from a a, a – mission values and vision perspective you can have a clearer mission to make private business owners that provide 70 percent of all employment much better off to make 
your accountants better off, to make your communities better off. Um, that's easy. You can have clear values. So, um, you know, want the best for others, not be self-centered. Most technical people are impressed with their technical skills rather than focused on the client. Do what you say and play as part of a team. That's pretty simple. And then in terms of a vision, build a platform that you could put on, under any accounting firm, you know, certainly in the world and make, make them run better. Well, you can't make them run worse. So that's doable. And there's, there's a lot of them. So the addressable market's better than people perceive. And the good news is nobody thinks of it as an industry. So it's probably an opportunity. And then you get up to strategy. You know, what's your objective? What's your scope? What's your advantage? Your objective is to grow them in an intelligent way with a model that's unique. Your scope is Sydney to start with across four service lines and your advantage is we've systemized the client system, we've systemized the back-end system and we've built an internal flywheel in terms of how we centralize up what we do as services to, to the businesses that as we get bigger, we get more self-generating cash flow into the services team to continue to improve the business as opposed to a local office where you've got two partners, they make, you know, a hundred bucks, they take $51 each and continually sort of rape and pillage the business. So there's nothing to reinvest. Then you get up to structure, which is your 51, 49, 10 year agreements, just a better way of doing things done in other industries. Osbroke is steadfast and private equity generally in terms of real genuine alignment, people process financials, clients, financials, brand growth, risk, IT and exit succession. Make sure that we've got a system in each of those parts. Jim Collins style say, great, you need a strong mission here, you need fuel here, and you need a system and systemize and drive and drive and drive. So now you're quite right. When you look at accounting, you think, well, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, why hasn't it been done? And I'm like, I don't know. But it has been done. The big four are massive global businesses in 150 countries. So it's not like it hasn't been done. There's probably 100 year old accounting firms. 100 year old anythings in any other industries um but in this private client market where i think private companies will stay private for longer and they'll seek to go global i think there's an opportunity now it suits me that no one agrees with me much um some people do there's a few cluey people that do um and i don't really have any interest in in prosecuting the argument other than delivering and and you know showing I always say we're in show business, not tell business. You know, just show people that we can do it. So, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that um, I always say that you look at the big, very successful tech companies, you know, everyone thinks Airbnb is incredible, but it's an improved version of a hotel. So what they're doing is improving a massive global industry. They didn't invent a new global industry. Tesla is making a car better, right? So... Um, you know, are people really strongly of the view that I can't make accounting firms better? And if they are, I'm, I'm, you know, happy to take that Pepsi challenge. I'm that sort of person. You spoke before about, you know, value creation uh, being the return on invested capital over and above the weighted average cost of capital. Can you maybe um, pull apart what you've experienced so far at Kelly Partners as what's been the driver of that return on invested capital and those levers and I'm guessing I'm trying to find out like the replication, like how do you keep doing that as you scale, as you get bigger and bigger? Like I, I think you've quoted Mark Leonard a few times, Constellation Software. Um, you know, he's got to a point where he's so big that now he has multiple business units underneath him and the, the people make decisions there. How are you thinking about that challenge? Well, what we're doing is, you know, studying. Bit, so my favorite businesses are Berkshire Hathaway, Louis Vuitton, Moe Hennessy and Constellation. So most people are familiar with Berkeley. They buy things decentralized, leave them. Nothing's really related to anything. So there's no real synergy created. Louis Vuitton, Moe Hennessy is a little bit different. They buy amazing heritage brands and they improve them. They centralize a few things, legal finance and um, global finance and advertising and some leasing. Um, but just the things that they can really make a difference to, not everything. So that's to me, that's sort of Buffett um, with a tweak. And, and those individual Maisons that they own have their own personalities and their own strong brand equity and off they go. Um, and then there's Mark who, you know, I think that's such a big business now with six operating groups. It's easy for people when massive to not understand that, you know, I've got here a piece of paper that's got all of Mark's 
acquisition since 2005. And so it just shows me that he's done, you know, X number per year. And how much he's, you know, average deal size is 4 million. Sort of size deals we're doing, 2 to 5 million. He's done 714 that are on this list. Um, but he's done that over a long period of time. So I, f I think the first thing you would say is I think they listed in 96. It's a 25-year effort. And most people are looking for a 25-minute, you know, situation. He doesn't centralize up in the way that we do. Some of the things that deliver a big cost out to these businesses and a big time return. We think we can give 40% of a partner's time back to them, double their profits and reduce their working capital by two thirds, which are pretty helpful things. Um, and we do that by having this central team that takes basically everything out of that business other than running the team and running the clients for the partners. Um, that just makes it a nicer place for them to work because they're now accountants, not part-time IT, part-time marketing, part-time HR. And we think it's duplicatable. The way we're thinking of it is we are number 22 in Australia. We think we'll do 80 plus million coming year. We think that makes us somewhere between 16 and 18. We think we need to get to 120 top 10. That's the objective. Um, there's four firms doing 2 billion. Then there's four firms doing Five firms doing 250 million. There's one doing 125. We want to be, say, number 10 to be top 10. Um, then you'd need to double in Australia to 250 to sort of progress from there. We think we can do that, but we'd be inching out ground potentially um, that's harder to take and less profitable. I, I don't think that's necessarily true, but we'll, we'll deal with that when we get there. And we think we can get to that top 10 position within two years. Once we're at that point, um, you know, what we're, what we're building out is how do we take the solution that we have, which we think of that we can put under accounting firms anywhere that deal with SMEs and have the sorts of issues that all accounting firms globally appear to have. I just did nearly five weeks in the US speaking to people all over the world that have approached us, interestingly enough. It's very interesting. Um, investors in talent I'm out of um, Finland have introduced us to people in Finland and Sweden and a guy out of France who's bought himself eight firms, ex-investment banker, guys out of the US, the UK. Um, and they all have similar issues. Baby boomers wanting to retire, next generation trying to work out a better way to own and operate these businesses. And we do think we have a unique way to do that. What we, you know, for me, I like McDonald's and Constellation. McDonald's, I think, have got five regional, five regions globally. So Middle East, Africa, and um, and then Europe, um, UK, North America. I have East and West, but we won't need that in Asia. And we'll focus on places like New Zealand, the UK are the easy ones, Canada, Commonwealth countries, and then the US. So we think that gives us four markets, five in total, where what we're doing is very duplicatable. We point to Talonom, who's listed in Finland, and they're already in three or four countries running a software-style solution for some SMEs in four or five different languages already. We don't intend to operate in, you know, in four or five languages at this point, although we've got quite a bit of interest out in Germany, funnily enough. Um, so... You know, that's where where we're going. We see a regional structure, a software stack that's able to be used anywhere, uh, operating methodology for, you know, structuring and owning these firms on a sort of permanent basis with partners, operating partners that can deliver them more time and a better financial return. Now, that normally freaks people out because they're like, oh, how are you going to do that? But... That's more than I've ever shared publicly, Owen. We, we'll just, you know, go about what we're doing. We definitely won't make a large acquisition in any other market. We've never made a large one here of any crazy size. Um, I think largest is $8 million. Um, And Constellation style, I was very privileged when I was over in Omaha to meet the gentleman who was the first to sell his company to Constellation, Mark Miller. He now runs one of the operating groups. I think he's taken it from... 25 or 50 people to 11,000 people in 45 countries. So I had an hour, hour and a half with him explaining sort of how we did that. And obviously we've appointed Lawrence Cunningham to our board 
who's a deputy chairman of Constellation Software. So, you know, that might have been a little bit of an indication of people sort of how we think about the future. I did. I, I saw that first on Twitter. I saw it pop up. How did that come to be? Yeah, so about a year ago, I was publishing my um, quality shareholders newsletters based on the format of his book called Quality Shareholders. I got to the point where I was sick of speaking to short-term people. So I thought, well, it's my company. I'm going to write about it in the way that I speak about it. And so I started writing these quality shareholders notes because I'm not really into writing a big annual letter. That's not the way my brain really works. Um, I'd rather, if you're my partner, I'd rather share with you contemporaneously what's important to the business today and try and save it all up one Frankly, there's too much going on once as we try to educate up a quality shareholder base. So I started writing those and a guy in Spain, actually, it turns out, sent it, who knew Lawrence, sent it to him and he read it, checked out the company and then sent me an email, said, hey, I love your company. I'd love to have a Zoom if you're interested. So I got to know him on Zoom during these lockdowns. Um, similarly, an email from William Thorndike, the author of The Outsiders, just randomly. I was in the butcher one day and I read it. I thought it was somebody talking about him, but it was actually him. And I got to meet meet with him over Zoom, and 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 then his investment officers is it is a shareholder of KPG that that bought a bunch of shares, um, and so we got to know him well. And again, this is you know to me about Buffett saying get yourself around people that have got different life experience, high standards, better whatever, and learn from them. And so what I enjoy most about the business is that it's a vehicle to allow me to continue to meet clearly people that are interested in what we're doing that are prepared to, to help us. And the best people are generally the most generous with their knowledge. So I then said to Lawrence, look, this is what our 10 year plan is, you know, around our big hairy audacious goal and where we want to be when we grow up. And um, I'd love you to get involved, sit as a shadow director, sort of serving director and tell us what you think. And if you like it, you know, I know you're on Constellations board, which is slightly bigger than us. I'd love to get you on the board and get you to mentor me and help me understand how I could um, grow the business in the way we intend. And what's been terrific about that, went to Omaha. He was so generous while we were there, introducing me to amazing people. They've, you know, continue to inspire you, which is really important and teach you things. So look, we, you know, that's, that's to me incredibly exciting. Oh, for sure. Um, I imagine there are many shareholders that are listening to this podcast uh, that are your shareholders. Um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by the business in general, and I'm going to keep following you in the business for many years, I hope. If you were looking at your own company today, how would you measure your success? Are there factors that you would say, these are the factors to focus on to tell if I'm executing on the, the thesis? Yeah, so interestingly, Owen, what we're trying to do with the technology at the moment is be able to tell how many employees each of our clients have because what I've always wanted to be able to do is measure the impact of the business, particularly at the level of employees of our underlying clients to say, look, we have 13,000, 13, 14,000 business groups that we look after who employ X and our, a number of people. I believe, you know, having... Good work is very important to a dignified life. And I believe that the role of these private business owners in providing that work is, is often not given the credit that it's due. And so they're the people that I wanted to help to provide that employment. So imminently do that much better. Um, and then I love my ENPS measures. So my employee NPS, my um, net promoter score measures for our clients. Um, because I think if we look after our people well, um, then they will look after our clients well. And so I tend to look at those measures very carefully. I've always said that your staff turnover is a measure of satisfaction, as is as are your debtor days. So we've always focused very strongly on low debtor days. We think that people that are happy with you pay you and that people that are unhappy with you, most people aren't that confrontational. So they won't ring you up and abuse you. They'd rather just not pay your bill. Where, where they're trying to tell you something without telling you something. Um, so low debtor days, we think, you know, high client satisfaction, low staff turnovers, um, uh, ult the ultimate measure of of, um, of the satisfaction of your people. 
Now, then there's all those other things. So I always had um, Colin says, set your hedgehog. Um, what are you deeply passionate about? What's the economic um, engine and what can you be in the world at? And I said, well, I'm deeply passionate about helping private business owners provide employment, particularly in these local areas. I think we can be the best in the world at that. And the economic drivers, gross profit percentage. And then I'm reading 100 baggers this, this year or late uh, last year again. And it's funny how things strike you at different times, but you know, in hundred baggers, they say that the number one predictor of excellent long-term hundred bagginess is gross profit percentage. So we've had that as our, you know, thing to focus on sort of one number from the beginning, um, which is really interesting, just how things come together. So, um, you know, there, there's some of the things I'm a return on equity guy, return on invested capital, cash flow per share. I like these types of measures, in particular per share. You'll notice we called out to we exactly 45 shares because I used to ask our board and others, oh, how many shares we've got on issue? And everyone could tell you the profit, but they couldn't tell you the number of shares on issue. Most firms are throwing shares around so they can never tell. I think that's incredibly important to long-term value creation and we're fanatical about making sure that, that that's effectively managed, um, i.e. I have no interest in issuing new shares for virtually any reason that I can think of. Um, and, I, I, you know, I would never say never because I think it's not prudent, but, you know, I'm pretty close. Um, so they're the, they're the things that we think about. Um, top line growth is very important in a, you know, for this firm to be able to ensure that there's for growth for the people in the firm. So we, you know, pay a lot of attention to that. Mm. I've got a couple of, um, just a couple of closing out questions here, if I may. The first is if you were to come across a new CEO um, let's say someone that's just been promoted to CEO and they've got you know, a business of 100 people, what book would you give them? It would depend on the person that I met. I did meet one this week, actually, so that's interesting. Um, but it would very much depend on that person. I think Snowball is like the Snowball is just a tremendous book for many of the reasons I've mentioned. But um, And so... At Kelly Partners, we have like a compulsory reading list that everyone has to read when they join. And we always have had that list ever since I started. So ever since we started, you have to read Good to Great and um, Raving Fans. And if you don't if you don't read them in a six-month probation, then you, you know, need to either resign or get terminated. Um, so we believe common ideas lead to a common language and you can't have a common culture if you don't have a common language. So I... You know, I would say to most people, I would take good to great, given it's been around for so long as read. Um, and then I'd sort of be interested in the personal attributes of that um, of that CEO. There, there was something that you said. I think it was in a. I, I think it was a interview that you're in. You said, "The great tension in life is the difference between who we are and who we want to be." Can you? I don't know if you remember where you said that um, or if it, I may be misquoting you, but, um, where you said that and what it, what it means. It's absolutely the okay. case. So, you know, most people, if they look at their lives, so I always say think about the person before the business, right? Um, think about the person before anything else. And so the great tension in life is is for everyone, you know, the gap between, you know, who they, who they are and who they want to be. Now, there's who they think they are, they really are, and there's who they, you know, at their best could be. And so closing that gap, I think, is the great mission of life. And um, often people don't either get a coach to help them assess that gap or honestly, you know, assess their own their own gap. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's the great tension in that, most people know that they could be healthier, they could be wealthier, and they could be wiser. And that the only reason that they're not those things, to the degree that they know they could be, is because they haven't decided that it's absolutely critical that they close that gap or die trying. So, you know, and then I, I heard the other day that the sort of price of regret is much higher than the cost of discipline. And so I, you know, my brother died when I was at a car accident when I was just turned 30 and he was 45. And I said to myself, I want to live 
as if I've only got until I'm 45 so that I don't waste time. I remember I was 22, I was in Florence in an art gallery and there were these great Renaissance paintings and on a lot of the desks of the paintings, there was, there was a skull with a candle in it. And I said to the, the tour guide, I said, why is there these skulls in all these pictures? And she said, well, they wanted to remind themselves that time was very limited. You know, life expectancy was 35, 40. And so don't waste your life. You know, your life is sort of disappearing in front of you, that burning candle. And so, you know, I think we all sort of know that um, to a degree when we, in a forum like this, talk about it. The question is, have you got a third plan, a sort of annual plan? Have you marked up your calendar? Have you carried it around on a card to make sure that, you know, if you get knocked off tomorrow through no fault of your own, that you haven't left any gas in the tank? So that's... You know, that's one way of thinking. It's not, I'm never prescriptive and say to other people, well, you should think like that. But I've met a lot, you know, I just decided that the one, the, the only filthy thing in life, um, self-inflicted is regret. So you want to minimize that to the degree that you can. Yeah, I, I like it. And um, yeah, the cost of regret, um, if we can minimize that. I think I use that framework a lot, not just with uh, my investing why I make business decisions, the way I choose to spend my time as well. I've got one final question for you, Brett, which is similar to what I always ask my guests, which is if you could go back and tell yourself one thing about investing, what would it be? Payback period. So too many people don't understand very much um, around cash. So Buffett has this idea of a dollar goes into a business and how does it actually flow through that business and not an adjusted dollar, not a normalized dollar, but an actual dollar. There's a lot of that around these days. Um, I've always been focused on a sort of cash on cash return. I'm a real cash flow guy. So if I give you a million dollars, whatever the investment is, so we buy your business. If we put out a million dollars, when do we get that money back? And because I started with no money, you know, I borrowed, I had, I think, a $200,000 fee base and I borrowed $160,000 from Westpac, who'd been a great partner of ours. I knew I couldn't, I didn't get paid back. So the question all investing in my view is, what's your payback period? And, you know, from a business perspective, the one thing I would say is be more long-term than your competitors and be prepared to out-invest them. Or as Ray Kroc founder of mcdonald's would say you know when your um competitors are thirsty shove the fire hose down their throat and turn it on full ball uh, so um i think out investing you know bernard i know talks about just out invest your comp competition um and a big part of what we're doing at kelly partners is with our central services team we get paid a fee for central services and a fee for ip and we take that 9% that comes of the revenue of our businesses and it's fully invested back into making these businesses stronger and building out that flywheel and building out that moat, how you build a moat. Well, if you out-invest your competition for a long time and you use some smarts and work at it, then I think there's a real opportunity. So that's, you know, that's my payback period. It's a big one, not understood by most in terms of investing. Um because that takes away the certainty of that payback period, takes away a lot of the conjecture about the long-term business case and what the mode is and blah, blah, blah. The question is, are you going to lose money? Buffett, don't lose money, don't lose money, don't lose money. So I'm all about what's my payback period? Am I going to lose money? I like it. And you're the only one that's ever said that on the show so far. So um, Yeah, I don't like you. losing money. I don't <laughs> like losing money. So look, I, I, you know, my whole... For anyone who's a big reader out there, there's a great book called From Predator to Icon. It's a couple of French academics that have studied um, great entrepreneurs and they say the American model is risk take, whereas in fact the data shows that the greatest entrepreneurs are the ones who are the best at mitigating risk. Um, so to me, um, you cannot, using an old cricket analogy, you can't score runs from the grandstand. So you cannot get out. You must not lose money. You must not do anything that puts you in mortal danger. And it is better to take a long time than than to get out. You know, so we are 
a high growth business operating in a sustainable manner with a very long-term view because we think the run in the total addressable market Australia and globally is enormous and you know i'm 47 my heroes are 91 and 98 so i don't feel um True. while i never take any day for granted ever i don't feel that we should try and make you know um un unsustainable decisions on a sh on the wrong timeline i like it brett if you're a uh, small business owner listening to this head to the kelly partners website particularly from the eastern seaboard you can uh, get in contact with the team there. Um, and I'll provide all the links in the show notes as well as to Brett's um, YouTube page, the Kelly Partners YouTube page, which is fantastic. So many conversations in there, including a presentation from, from Lawrence. Um, but Brett, I really appreciate your time. You've got a you've got a calendar, you've got calendars and calendars and you plan your week out. And I just really appreciate you taking the time out this afternoon to speak with me, Matt. No problem. You're in the calendar. So it's easy. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, um, I really appreciate you um, having us on and for anyone that's interested, just have a look at kellypartners.com.au or have a look at our um, Kelly Partners Group Holdings website. And if you've got any questions, just be in touch and, um, and I'm sure we can um, can answer them. Brilliant, mate. Thanks, for, thanks again and until next time, cheers. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.